IKEA is one of the most recognizable retailers in the world. From the meatballs in its restaurants to its winding maze on the main floor, the company built a connection with consumers by providing a unique shopping experience, not just a store. It offers roughly 9,500 products, and if you've ever been inside an IKEA store, you know how hard it is to leave the place in a timely manner. And to think that all of this is the brainchild of a boy who once had to sell matches for pennies to make ends meet. This story is an impressive rags to riches tale that is not spared of its fair share of controversies. You probably know that one of IKEA's special features are the unusual names of its products. Well, besides the fact that they make the furniture more familiar and thus encourages customers to buy them, there is another good reason for those seemingly wacky names. And if you ever wondered what IKEA stands for, today, you'll find that out too. If while seeing his name, you wondered how to pronounce it, don't worry, we went through the same debacle. And according to Wikipedia, this is how it's done. Ingvar Kamprad Born in 1926 on a farm in rural Sweden, Kamprad did things differently from the start. At the time, poverty was widespread, and all the citizens, children included, were expected to waste nothing, not even time. You see, where Ingvar lived, the stony land produced poor crops, farming wasn't enough to survive, and people had to be innovative to make ends meet. Many families became entrepreneurs, selling homemade goods or preserved foods. But while little Ingvar was supposed to go to work on his father's family farm, the savvy young boy believed he had a better idea. He understood his family's hardship and wanted to help. But rather than doing farm chores, he focused on helping the family finances directly. He bought matchbooks in bulk and sold them individually. At the time, he was just five years old. And although his small contributions did not make a huge difference, his family did the unconventional and supported their little match-selling entrepreneur. Good with numbers and a quick learner, Kamprad realized he should expand his little business. And by the time he was 10, he was selling pens, pencils, garden seeds, Christmas cards, and magazines. At 14, he moved to attend boarding school nearby. Ever the entrepreneur, he kept a stock of pens, watches, wallets, and belts under his bed. After all, his classmates needed these and would be willing to pay for them. The young man worked hard and did well in his studies. And although Kamprad was dyslexic, he never let that hold him back. In fact, he even managed to turn it into his superpower, but more on that later. After his studies, Kamprad felt ready to start his own company. But as he was still too young to set it up himself, his father gave legal counsel and paid the registration fees as a graduation present in 1943. IKEA was the name of the store and Kamprad was 17 years old but he wouldn't be selling any furniture just yet. As for how he came up with the idea IKEA, the letters weren't chosen because they roll so nicely off the tongue. It's an acronym, and each letter has a special meaning. It's his initials, Ingvar, Kamprad, followed by E for Elmtared, the family farm he grew up on, and Agenarad, his home village. The first IKEA sold small household goods like pens, wallets, and frames for pictures. It would be five years before the store got into the furniture business. It all began as a simple experiment. The post-war Swedish government had built lots of housing and offered home furnishing loans. Plus, there were many small furniture factories nearby. Perhaps this was the way to go. Kamprad was willing to give it a chance. And when furniture debuted in the 1948 brochure, he wrote IKEA would offer more if customers showed reasonable interest. They did. By then, Kamprad had also already realized that success depended on the simplest, most cost-efficient distribution from factory to customer. And he launched the iconic IKEA catalog in 1951. The mail-order catalog was an essential part of IKEA's business from the very start. After all, this area of Sweden was pretty rural and remote. 
Reaching customers in bigger cities, especially back in the 1940s and 1950s, was difficult. The catalog itself was cheap, chic, and convenient. But the prices were so low that people were skeptical about the quality of the furniture. So, to boost trust, Comprad rented an old workshop into his showroom to display his furniture, allowing customers to take a look for themselves. Comprad was also behind the simple yet revolutionary innovation that is the flat pack. He chanced upon the brilliant innovation while seeing a catalog manager, Gillis Lundgren, struggle to load a bulky, long-legged table into the back of his car. Comprad's solution? In a bout of frustration, he simply knocked off the table's legs. That was born the concept of self-assembled furniture that is easy to ship. From that point on, as many products as possible were packed in this manner, and it encouraged IKEA's designers to embrace a clean and minimalistic design and aesthetic, which became the very philosophy of the company. But troubles were on the horizon. By 1955, Comprad's manufacturers began boycotting IKEA due to its low prices. But Savvy Comprad once again came up with an ingenious solution. He simply brought production and design in-house. Now, his concept was finally complete. And from then on, Comprad designed, produced, and showcased flat-packed and sold his furniture himself, all from his own warehouse. So far, so good. But there was still one minor issue. Perhaps you remember that we mentioned that Comprad was dyslexic. Well, because of this, he struggled with remembering and interpreting the product's numeric codes. But instead of delegating those responsibilities to another person and avoiding the issue altogether, Comprad used his disability to his advantage by coming up with a more creative system for organizing his products. And eventually, it would become the most iconic aspect of his now worldwide business. As it was easier for Comprad to remember nouns instead of numbers, he created a naming system where he gave practical names to each piece of furniture. For example, large furniture is given names of Swedish places, garden furniture is named after Swedish islands, and chairs and desks have men's names. Since most of the names were of familiar places, this system was much easier for Comprad to remember. In a way, he truly managed to turn a potential weakness into his strength a quality that many successful entrepreneurs have in common. Comprad was truly an unusual CEO, and anecdotes about him abound. According to Comprad, we should all divide our lives into 10-minute units and sacrifice as few of them as possible in meaningless activity. And when his father complained that he slept late in the morning, the young entrepreneur got himself an alarm clock, set it for six o'clock, and yanked away the off button. He was known for calling his employees co-workers, and he always encouraged everyone to dress informally. He had also been dead set on keeping IKEA private, and throughout his entire tenure, he never borrowed money or issued a stock. In 2013, however, Comprad decided it was time to step down. Following his decision, the then 87-year-old founder explained, I see this as a good time for me to leave the board of Inner IKEA Group. By that, we are also taking another step in the generation shift that has been ongoing for some years. Even after his resignation, the billionaire continued to traverse the globe, visiting new IKEA stores until his death in 2018. And despite his great wealth, he did all of this frugally. He flew economy class, drove the same old Volvo for more than 20 years, stayed in cheap hotels and even replaced bottles from the hotel minibar with cheap bottles from local supermarkets. He was also notoriously press shy and never, ever gave an interview. But Comprad also faced his fair share of controversies. In 1994, he admitted to having ties to pro-Nazi and socialist political parties in the 1940s and 1950s. And in 2012, an audit found political and criminal prisoners in East Germany produced IKEA products without compensation from the 1960s through the 1980s. The study also said that IKEA representatives at the time knew that political prisoners were possibly used. IKEA funded the audit and released the findings, which is good but that it knowingly used forced labor to turn a profit, not so good. 
and those weren't the last stains on the company's reputation. Although his net worth reached billions, Comprad always aimed to save every penny, and he always shrugged his shoulders for tax. To avoid paying his fair share, the Swedish entrepreneur funneled money through his sister company in the Netherlands and then moved that money to tax havens elsewhere in Europe. The numbers are staggering, but it boils down to IKEA avoiding paying more than 1 billion euros in European taxes over the years. Remember Comprad's thrifty ways? Well, this is where the line between frugal and stingy becomes a bit blurry and his behavior was a bit of an extreme and thwarted version of the saying that many successful entrepreneurs live by, never spend what you don't have. Whether Kaprat was admirably frugal or abdominally stingy is up to you to decide. And of course, his chronic tax evasion is not a good look. But what's certain is that forming a habit of being frugal will still have a positive impact on your business and life as a whole. Frugality is a state of mind and frugal spenders tend to be more content with what they have and do not feel a constant urge to keep up with the Joneses. Furthermore, as an entrepreneur, you should never simply consider the cost of something. Instead, think in terms of their opportunity cost, which is what you could have made by putting your money and time somewhere else. Despite the founder's previous pro-Nazi ties, the slave labor scandal, and the tax evasion, IKEA continued to do well. For many years, it held a position of being the untouchable, stalwart retail giant, and none of the controversies could hamper its success. But in 2018, something changed. Several things, in fact. And IKEA was forced to reevaluate the direction of its business. After six years, its mediagenic head of design, Marcus Ingman, abruptly left the company to start his own consultancy. And IKEA's multi-billion dollar profit margin had been shrinking dramatically over the years. To make matters worse, the general trend of digitalization and the increasing amount of online shopping meant traditional stores were now grappling with a sudden shift to online sales. At the time, IKEA had an antiquated online strategy which really only served as a digital catalog to get customers to visit the store. But knowing what was holding it back, the company knew a massive restructuring was needed. So it did just that. And soon enough, the future of IKEA started looking a lot more like the distribution hubs of Amazon. This goes to show that it is not enough to simply react to change. Instead, you must anticipate and prepare for it. And perhaps even better, embrace it. As the Greek philosopher Heraclitus once said, change is the only constant. An important step towards coping with change is understanding it. What is happening? Why? And how? When you recognize the possibilities created by change, you are more prepared to exploit them. And this is why constantly educating yourself is so important. Eventually, you will see change not as something to fear, but as something to welcome and turn to your own advantage. However, IKEA's transition to the digital era has not been entirely smooth sailing. And while the company proclaimed its e-commerce business doubled due to COVID-19, without the capacity to handle it, the customer complaints soared as well. 2020 was filled with stories of unfilled orders, inept customer service, and long drives to pick up furniture that was marked out of stock 30 minutes before the customers arrived. Nonetheless, IKEA's online sales are currently booming, and while its stores remained shut for most of 2020 due to worldwide lockdowns, being forced to spend so much time indoors led to shoppers spending more money on their homes. And according to the Swedish furniture giant, the trend is here to stay. Today, IKEA is not just a store or a destination. It is an entire experience in itself. Through the launch of its restaurant and its maze-like store layout, the company manages to provide an impeccable experience to anyone who walks through its doors, almost like Disneyland Park with a furniture theme. This was the story of a savvy little boy who went from selling matches for pennies to running a billion-dollar business. With humble roots, packs of matches, and the desire to help his family, he eventually changed millions of lives with home furnishings. 
And although he has been involved in quite a few controversies, IKEA remains one of the world's best-known brands. Every year, nearly a billion people walk through the doors, either hoping to find a nice item, enjoy some meatballs, or simply get lost in the maze-like store. What did you learn from this story? And do you have a business in mind that you would like us to cover in the future? Make sure to share it in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video. And don't forget to check out our channel for more inspiring business videos.